Uh, to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Ed Song, uh, scholar in residence and professor of philosophy. Come on up, Ed. Good morning, Westmont. Uh, I am very pleased to be introducing Sandra McGuire to you all this morning. Professor McGuire is one of our NetView Chapel speakers this semester. You will remember that the NetView program here at Westmont is funded by a grant from the Lilly Foundation to encourage reflection about issues of vocation or calling at liberal arts colleges and universities around the country. Here at Westmont, we are using the grant to bring in chapel speakers to talk about career, calling, and vocation. Some of these speakers have offered theologies of vocation, but at least part of our idea was to bring in speakers who could act as models for what it is to wrestle actively, intentionally, and faithfully with questions about who we are and what we might be equipped to do. If you are looking for a model of how to do this well, you could do far worse than look to Sandra McGuire. Professor McGuire is one of the foremost national experts on helping students to acquire the study and learning skills that are necessary for academic success. Up until her retirement in 2013, Dr. McGuire was the Assistant Vice Chancellor and Professor of Chemistry at Louisiana State University. She was also the director of LSU's Center for Academic Success, which was recognized as being the best college learning center in the country under her leadership. She's the author of scores of scholarly articles on student learning and pedagogy, a popular chemistry textbook series, as well as her own book, Teach Students How to Learn, which lays out the strategies and tools she's been using over the course of her career to help improve student learning outcomes. Copies of the book, for what it's worth, I think are available in the Westmont Bookstore. Her list of awards and accomplishments is too long to enumerate, but they include a presidential award for excellence in mentoring, which she received in a White House Oval Office ceremony in 2007. Now, I myself taught at LSU before coming to Westmont and can testify to Professor McGuire's work firsthand. She had this reputation for being a kind of a miracle worker. She hates it when people say that, but it's true, a kind of a miracle worker. And you'd hear these crazy stories about students who would be flunking out of chemistry or math or history or whatever, and they would go down to the Center for Academic Success and spend 30 or 45 minutes with Professor McGuire or the other people in the crew down there. And then they would start getting straight A's in all of their classes. Part of the secret sauce for that work was that all of their learning strategies and study skills were rooted in the best, most cutting edge research in psychology and cognitive science about how the brain works. But more important was the sheer dedication, care, concern, and love that Professor McGuire had for anyone who knocked on her door. And when you talk to students who had spent time with her, you could tell that they were touched and transformed in ways that go beyond the merely academic. I could go on and on. Dr. McGuire grew up in South Louisiana in a time of great social turmoil and was among the first students to integrate the public high schools in Louisiana in the 60s. Her whole family, her husband, her siblings, and her own kids are remarkable in their achieve achievements. It's kind of ridiculous. Her daughter was a Marshall Scholar has a PhD in neuroscience, but now is a professional opera singer in Berlin. I need to talk to you about your uh, parenting strategies so I can apply them to my own kids. But in any case, I should let Dr. McGuire tell her own story. So please join me in welcoming Professor McGuire to Westmore. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, Westmore. I am really, really pleased to be here. Uh, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Song. And I've had a wonderful time since I've been here. I worked with a group of students uh, yesterday afternoon. Any of those students here now? Okay, yes. And uh, so we talked about some of those learning strategies. And uh, for those of you who were not there, they videotaped. And so I know you're getting ready for finals. So uh, I encourage you to look at that before your finals. And uh, if you're not already making straight A's, I think that uh, A's are in your future. But I'm here today to share with you uh, my spirit-led journey, the academic, vocational, and spiritual journey that has brought me to where I am today. And so I want to start 
start by telling you a story. It's a true story. It was a story, um, it involved a Swiss aerodynamic scientist who was at a dinner party in Germany. And he got bored at the dinner party and so he started doing some calculations on his napkin. He started thinking about bumblebees and since he was an aerodynamic scientist he was looking at um, why it is that bumblebees can fly because as you can see from the image their wings are relatively short compared to their large body. And so he started doing calculations and the calculations indicated that bumblebees should not be able to fly. And so he did the calculations over and over and he still kept getting exactly the same result because the length of a bumblebee's wings are in proportion to the body are nothing like those of a wasp which has a sleek body and very long wings. And so he kept doing them over and over but and he got the same result as I said, bumblebees should not be able to fly. But because bumblebees do not know aerodynamic science, they don't know that they shouldn't be able to fly, and so they just keep right on flying. And so I think uh, many of us in this room, uh, this is our story that a lot of times people have determined for whatever their reasons that we shouldn't be able to be successful, but we don't uh, pay any attention to that. In many cases, we don't even know that because we know that God has equipped us to do what we need to do, what we want to do. And this was the situation with my family. And so I want to share that story with you briefly. And uh, it really began with my grandmother, Effie Jane Gordon Yancey, who started the legacy of education in our family. And um, she was actually the daughter of a freed slave in rural Greensburg, Louisiana. And uh, this is she, Effie Jane Gordon Yancey. And um, she lived in rural Greensburg. And as I said, she was the daughter of a freed slave. And um, she, though, uh, the Lord just put in her spirit that education was important and so she actually went to Leland College in Baker, Louisiana and I met a wonderful student last night whose grandparents live in Baker, Louisiana. Well there was a small college in Baker and so she went there and uh, she decided that all nine of her children would also attain a college education and that was very very rare back in those days because almost nobody went to college after in fact most people didn't even finish high school but she decided that she was going to make that possible and uh, they didn't have very much money but she did have some land that her father had acquired when he was freed from uh, slavery and she was able to parlay that land into a small loan that she used to build a home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana where all nine of those children would stay when they would attend Southern University and so she was very much led by the Lord. She was the example in our family of how if you listen to what the Lord tells you to do, you don't necessarily have to know where the resources are going to come from, but just know that he will provide that. And so I just wanted to show you uh, the college. Many of you may not be able to see this image, but this is an image of what Leland College looked like when she was there many, many years ago. And uh, these are her nine children, after they'd grown up, of course. And uh, all of them went to college, and seven of them got advanced degrees and I don't know if you can see there's a little arrow this is my father right here and um, he got his master's at Iowa State University um, Uncle Lester was at Kansas State uh, Aunt v, I'm sorry, V was Kansas State, he was Michigan State, she was UCLA, and they got their graduate degrees at these institutions rather than in Louisiana because back in those days LSU was not integrated and Louisiana would pay other states to educate their black students rather than integrate the institution. And so they actually got some first-rate educations but they had to leave their families to, to go away for these schools. Um, but those of us in my generation uh, actually had a wonderful model of what you could do when the Lord puts something important on your heart that you need to do. And so I want to tell you a little bit about um, the Yancey family. Uh, as you see, they were highly educated and they were also very committed to gaining educational equality for African Americans, uh, sometimes at great uh, risk of great peril to, uh, to themselves. Um, and they were, most of them became teachers, educators, principals and they were an integral part of the state school system in Louisiana. That was my father's family. Um, but I want you also to see my mom. Uh, 
uh, Delcy Melba Moore Yancey. Uh, she loved her hats, you can tell probably. Uh, she was known as a hat lady. But um, her family was uh, the Moore family, and uh, they were very well versed in the teachings of Marcus Garvey. I don't know if many people here have heard of Marcus Garvey, uh, but he was a very strong proponent of uh, having African Americans know about our very rich cultural heritage uh, in Africa and how rich a continent it was. And so from a very young age, I was very schooled in the, um, the riches in that part of the world. And uh, their family also was very committed to gaining equality for African Americans. And so let's fast forward a little bit, and now you'll see um, my family. And, and this is my dad again, and my mom. And I have three siblings. This is me back in the day. Uh, and this is uh, my older brother and uh, younger brother who's a pediatrician, and my sister who's a, a counselor now at, uh, at LSU. But uh, as you heard, I was uh, one of the first students to integrate the public schools in Baton Rouge. I actually went the uh, third year of integration. And uh, I just wanted to, to spend a minute to, uh, to tell you about that. In the image that you see now, Baton Rouge's troubled waters um, appeared in a documentary that talked about the resistance to integration in Baton Rouge. And the, the resistance was so strong that um, Baton Rouge actually closed nine swimming pools instead of integrating them. And uh, if you go to the city park today in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, most city parks in very hot southern cities will have a swimming pool. Uh, but there is no swimming pool in city park in Baton Rouge because they cemented it over when uh, they, were, um, they were forced to integrate. They said, well, no, we're not going to integrate. We'll just cement the pool. So there's not a pool there. Uh, and just to tell you a little bit about um, when I integrated uh, Glen Oaks, uh, that was, as you might imagine, uh, what I call a memorable experience. And uh, I was a, a junior at the time. And this is a, an image from my high school uh, yearbook. And I looked pretty different at the time, but this is me. And um, th I was in the, the junior class, and again, you know, fairly hostile um, circumstances, but uh, with the help of uh, the Lord, I was able to get through that. Uh, because for some reason, about the fourth or fifth day, in the midst of all the hostility, I found it very funny. I just found it very humorous. And so I was able to, to get through that uh, with humor. Um, and then the next image, uh, Dr. Song was telling a group yesterday that Baton Rouge actually went through the longest running desegregation lawsuit in the nation. It was just settled in 2003 and it lasted, believe it or not, for 47 years. And uh, they finally settled the, um, the lawsuit and so the schools now are integrated but in, as is the case in many cities, uh, the inner city is uh, probably 70% African American and the city schools it's still 90%. So we went from kind of segregation to integration back to now segregation again. Again. But uh, so that was kind of my life uh, uh, early on. And so I want to tell you a little bit about my undergraduate uh, education. I went to Southern University. Uh, it's an HBCU, a historically black college in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. But along the way, the Lord provided for me opportunities to get some amazing experiences. And so the summer after my sophomore year at Southern, I spent at Columbia University in New York City. My entire junior year I spent at the University of California at Berkeley and this was 68-69 and uh, you are much too young to know anything about those days uh, but 68-69 was the most turbulent year in the history of uh, UC Berkeley and then the summer after that I spent at Harvard uh, University and these were all special scholarship programs that were designed to equip students who were thought to have academic talent and ability to prepare us to become faculty members of the future. And, uh, and actually, the one at UC Berkeley was a result of a scholarship that was given by the Crown Zellerback Foundation because of environmental racism that was happening in uh, right outside of Baton Rouge. How many people here have heard the term environmental racism? 
Anybody? Oh, okay, I see a few, yeah. It refers to the phenomenon where there are a lot of industries that will dump toxic wastes in minority communities. And uh, Crown Zellerback was doing that, and they were found out, and they said, you know, mea culpa, we will clean up the site, and we'll give scholarships to two students at Southern and two students at Grambling, and we could go to either UC Berkeley, Stanford, or UCLA. And I chose Berkeley because it was the number one school in chemistry at the time. And uh, I had a great time at Berkeley. And so in fact, on the next slide, you will see uh, how I kind of physically transformed uh, from w the way I looked in high school. When I was a junior at Glen Oaks, that's the way I looked. Uh, but then when I was a junior at UC Berkeley, the, this is the way I looked. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so those were very, very, very interesting days, but I would not uh, trade uh, anything uh, for it. And so it was when I was in undergraduate school that uh, chemistry actually entered my life uh, also. And uh, it's an interesting story about how I became a chemistry major. When I went to, to college, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, I skipped my senior year of high school. So I went from 11th grade to college and really hadn't decided what I was going to major in, although I was always interested in math and science. And and uh, one day, the spring of my freshman year, I was walking down the hall, and the chair of the department uh, said, Miss Yancey, what are you going to major in? And I said, well, I don't know, Dr. White. It's either going to be math or, or science, but I haven't decided which one. And he said, well, why don't you major in chemistry? And I said, OK. <laughs> And that's actually how I got to be a chemistry major. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was really at UC Berkeley where I fell in love with chemistry. I had organic chemistry there. How many people here have heard of the Calvin cycle in biology? Anybody? Okay, yeah, a few people have. Well, I had organic chemistry from Melvin Calvin, the person who came up with the Calvin cycle, and so that was uh, a lot of fun. And so then after I finished uh, undergraduate school, I went to graduate school at Cornell University, and I got my master's there, and then I got my PhD at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And it was actually when I was at Cornell that I decided that instead of going into a chemistry to be a research chemist. I loved teaching, and so I decided that I wanted my life's work, and I, I know now that I was led by the Lord to do this, because this is really my calling, uh, to really look at issues of learning and teaching. And so my research is actually looking at ways that faculty can improve the way that we present information to students to improve learning, and also strategies that we can teach students to help them learn in a more efficient way. And so that's what I did. Uh, when I was in graduate school. And along the way, uh, family matters. And uh, so here you see uh, my husband, now 45 years, and uh, our two kids, uh, Carla and Stephanie. I'll tell you a little bit more about them later. And uh, this was many, many, many moons ago. And, uh, and this is my husband. Um, I, I met him when I was a 16-year-old freshman at Southern. He was an 18-year-old freshman. And, uh, and he was a physicist major and I, I figured okay so he's I think he's serious about academics but uh, we uh, got married five years later and he is still doing physics he's a faculty member at Southern and how many people here heard about the observation of gravitational waves the black holes yeah a lot of people have heard about that uh, my husband is one of the co-authors on the paper that announced that observation so uh, that was the big event in our family that uh, happened not too long ago but he's he's doing very well and uh, these are our two daughters, uh, all grown up now. Um, but this picture was taken on the occasion of our younger daughter's graduation from University of Oxford. As you heard, she was a Marshall Scholar. She did her PhD in neuroscience at, at Oxford. And, um, and her older sister is standing next to her. And I think she is a very good example of someone who goes through school but then finds that they're, like, they're called to do something else. So she sings opera now in Berlin. And I'll never forget the day that she told me that she was gonna become an opera singer. What do you think my reaction was? It's like, really? You serious? Um, but she was very serious, and so she's uh, she's doing well. And uh, I just wanted to to tell you a little bit. Our older daughter Carla is, and this is Carla and her family. Uh, this is uh, Joshua, Ruth. 
Daniel and Joseph Davis. Uh, my sister calls them the Old Testament warriors. Um, <laughs> and this is uh, Carla and Eric, but she's a faculty member at Baylor College of Medicine now. She's in pediatric allergy and immunology. And uh, she loves the Lord and they uh, have a very active uh, lay ministry, do a lot of activities in, um, in Houston. And uh, our younger daughter, the one who did the DPhil at Oxford and is now an opera singer, and uh, she's performed at Carnegie Hall and, uh, and she's done some things. But she moved to Berlin because there are a lot more opportunities for, uh, for classical singers in Berlin because there are just so many more uh, local opera companies. And so she is uh, trying to make her way uh, doing that. And so um, you've heard a little bit about my schooling and about my family, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about my uh, professional path, which was very much spirit-led uh, spirit and spirit-directed. Um, so I was a chemistry faculty member after I finished up my PhD at the University of Tennessee. And uh, then I became a learning strategist because I was very interested in helping students develop more uh, efficient learning. And then I became an administrator. I was assistant vice chancellor. And right now I'm an educational consultant. And uh, the book that I wrote, Teach Students How to Learn, you see the image uh, there. And you heard about the trip to the White House, which I never in my wildest would have imagined uh, that I would get to. But uh, that was uh, back in 2000, um, 2006 when I got the, the mentoring award. And so for those of you who were not there yesterday, I just want to take just a couple of minutes to talk to you about Let's see, okay, to talk to you about uh, the crux of the work that I do now. And it really is teaching students metacognitive learning strategies. And uh, metacognition is just, as the students who were there yesterday heard, uh, your ability to think about your own thinking, to know that you are a problem solver, be consciously aware that the Lord has given you the information, the ability to, when you have a problem in front of you, to consult him first, but then to know that you can address solving those problems. To monitor, control, and plan your mental processing. To accurately judge whether you're learning, how much you're learning, and this is very important as you come up to final exams, and to know what you know and what you don't know. So that you don't show up to an exam thinking, I know all this stuff, I know I have it down, but then you look at the test and say, oh, I guess I don't know all this stuff. And, um, and so the other thing that I wanted to show you from yesterday, and I think maybe the batteries are waning here. Um, but but uh, I presented what's called a study cycle. And um, you'll see the whole uh, session if you look at the tape. But I just always like to show this whenever I talk to a group of students, because it's a very simple study strategy that works for a lot of students. Just a five-step process uh, that you can start implementing immediately. And it starts with previewing information that's going to be covered in your classes before you go to class so that it prepares your mind for hearing what is going to be discussed. And it really helps with note taking, I'm told. Uh, the second step is just go to class and um, be there, not just physically, but also mentally. And you can do this if you've done your previewing. And then the third step is as soon after class as possible, review what just happened in class. Because when you hear something for the first time, what part of memory does it go into? Short term, exactly. And if you don't do something to move it into long term memory, then that information is going to be lost to you. But if you review it as quickly as possible, you can start it moving to long term memory. And then uh, doing the more what we call focused study, which uh, there are certain steps that go along with that. Take a couple of minutes to decide what you want to accomplish. And then 30, 40, 50 minutes or so, just focus with, uh, with action. Turn off the cell phone, turn off Instagram, all those kinds of distractions. And then after you've done that, review what you've just studied. And then if you can do two or three of those uh, study sessions, focus study sessions during the day, another one or two in the evening, you will find that you will have accomplished a lot. So if you can implement that between now and finals, I think that you're going to find that you'll get a lot done. And uh, this was a slide that I showed last night. And I just want to point it out to give you a little bit of motivation to look at what we did last night. These are just some scores 
hours uh, uh, that students had before the final exam. Uh, most of them were in the 60s, 46, 170, 83, but then 55, 65. But when the students started using the strategies, their final exam scores, 107, because there was a 10 point bonus, 88, 88, and 90. And the exam was on the 14th. This student who made 107 didn't learn the strategies until December 12th, students two and four December 2nd, and student three December 8th. So I wanted to show you that there is still hope for you to ace all your final exams, no matter where you are at this point in the, in the semester. And so um, what I want to do now is, uh, as we start to close, come to a close, I just want to share with you my spiritual walk that started uh, very early on at Mount Pilgrim Baptist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And so I just want to share with you how it was faith and not fate that determined my future. And, oh, and there's a scripture. Let me go back to that uh, if I can. Yeah, and, and the scripture that I like uh, for that is Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And I love that scripture because whenever you're in a situation where it seems that, uh, that everything is hopeless, if you go back to that, you can really think about that, no, the Lord has plans to prosper you. And if you're in a situation that seems like it's a huge problem, always remember that stumbling blocks and stepping stones look exactly the same. And you get to decide which one it's going to be. And if we know that the Lord loves us too much to allow us to stumble, we can see everything he puts in front of us as a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block. And so we'll talk about, about that. And so fate, if we look at what fate would have dictated as opposed to what faith declared, fate would have dictated that my grandparents and their nine children who lived in this rural area in Greensburg, Louisiana, Louisiana would be poor and uneducated, as were most people during that time. And, uh, but that's not what faith had in mind. Uh, faith decreed, according to Phil Philippians 4.19, that God would supply all of their needs according to his riches and glory. And he made it possible for all of their children to get the kind of education and have the kinds of careers that they had. And so if we look at the second instance, um, fate certainly would have dictated that I would not be able to successfully pursue a career in chemistry, a science that I didn't even take in high school. Uh, I took physics uh, as an 11th grader, didn't take chemistry. So when I got to college, I had no uh, chemistry at all. But faith decreed, according to Philippians 4.13, that I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I think that's really, really important for us to remember as you go into preparing for finals and organic chemistry might seem insurmountable. Uh, just remember that with these learning strategies, God has equipped you to do everything that you need to do. And uh, also, fate would have dictated that I would not meet my soulmate at 16 years old and celebrate our 45th wedding anniversary 50 years later and aren't we an adorable couple getting married? <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, but faith decreed that what God has joined together, let no man separate. And that's according to Mark 10 and 9. And so um, now I want to just share briefly with you five invaluable lessons that my faith walk um, has taught me. And the first one is that if you can dream it, you can achieve it. And this is from Philippians 1 and 6, which says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So whatever your dreams are, know that you can achieve that because God has prepared you to do it. Lesson two, when you're in the right place at the right time, good things happen and you are in the right place at the right time here at Westmont. And the scripture there is, I've seen something else under the I've, I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth, to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. And so we know as uh, servants of the Lord and those of us who live in Christ, nothing is by chance. God has already determined the path that we will go. He's 
ordained that. And we can make sure that we're in the right place doing what we need to do and he will take care of the rest. And then lesson three, pursue your passion and pursue it now. And as Dr. Song, I think, uh, mentioned, some of us can be sometimes torn between uh, what we feel our calling is and what we think might allow us to uh, become gainfully employed and not having to live in our parents' basement for uh, the next 10 years. Uh, but recognize that the passion that you have, the Lord has placed that in you for a reason. And uh, so you should pr pursue that now, according to Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 11.4, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. And so be attuned to what the Holy Spirit is telling you, but know that when you have a passion, there's a reason for that, and you can pursue that. And then the fourth lesson is if we put God first, he will give us the desires of our heart. And this, of course, is Psalms 37 and 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And so we have to put his will and his way first and subjugate our will and desires to that. And if we do that, then he will allow us to, uh, to experience the fulfillment and the joy that he's already ordained that we are to have. And then finally, lesson five is that God has equipped you to achieve what he has called you to do. And that scripture is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebu rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so just know that he, at this point in time, is preparing you to do what he knows your life work will be. And so as I come to a close, I want to go back to the story about the bumblebee. And, uh, and it's a true story I think I mentioned to you. And, uh, and tell you why it is that bumblebees can fly. Well, it turns out that when this aerodynamic scientist was doing these calculations, this was in the 1930s, so it was at the very beginning of aerodynamic science. And so the model that he was using for his calculation was airplane wings because that's what aerodynamics, uh, the, when they were looking at the proportions of wing size and span to the body, he was using airplane wings. But the difference, of course, is that airplane wings are very, very different from bumblebee wings. Airplane wings are very smooth and flat, and they're rigid, they don't move. But on the other hand, if we look at bumblebees, the bumblebee wings are uh, they have bumps, lots of bumps on them, they have lots of ridges, zigs and zags, and they are constantly flapping. And it's this constant flapping among those bumps and zigs and zags that gives the bumblebee enough air to stay aloft, creates an airfoil to stay aloft. And so I love this story because I like to encourage all of us to, whenever we see a bumblebee, and this is just an image where you can see the, the bumblebee wings uh, flapping, and you can also see here, how small they seem to be in relation to the bumblebee's body. But I just want us to remember that whenever we see a bumblebee from now on, just let us remind us, rather remind us that there are a lot of people out there whose calculations will tell them that you are not going to be successful in what you're pursuing, what God has already told you you are to pursue. And there are people out there who try to discourage you. And so when you encounter those people and they say, oh, you're never going to do this, so you're never going to do that. Just think of the bumblebee and recognize that they thought the bumblebee couldn't uh, fly because the assumptions were incorrect. The assumptions that were used to make the calculations were incorrect. So whenever somebody tells you you can't be successful, tell them check your assumptions. Because if you're telling me that I can't do what I know God has equipped me to do, you're using the wrong assumptions. And just watch me live in the spirit and accomplish everything that God has placed in me to accomplish. And so I want to thank you. Thank you.